I'm Michelle, and on behalf of CIS, I'm thrilled that you are here for what should prove to be an informing and timely discussion on religion and violence. Our speakers tonight include Haroon Mogul, who is a fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding and a PhD candidate at Columbia University. He is a senior correspondent at Religion Dispatches and a columnist at the Muslim Observer and has spoken widely on Islamic history and culture, contemporary politics in the Muslim world, and radicalism and religious identity. We also have with us J. Brian Hare, who is the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of the Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is also the Secretary for Healthcare and Social Services in the Archdiocese of Boston. His research and writing focuses on ethics and foreign policy and the role of religion in world politics and in American society. We also have Stephen Van Evra, who is chairing our discussion. Steve is from MIT. He is a Ford International Professor here in the Political Science Department. He works in several areas of international relations, the causes and prevention of war, U.S. foreign policy, U.S. security policy, U.S. intervention in the third world, international relations in the Middle East, and international relations theory. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. And leading off our talk will be Haroon. Good afternoon. I'm usually pretty loud, so if the mic's not working or it's too far away, hopefully, you know, you can still hear me. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Yes, awesome. Uh, I'd like to start with just an observation. There are no trash cans on M MIT campus. It's really frustrating. I don't know why that is. Um, I was carrying around a really cold Coca-Cola beverage for the last 25 minutes. It's kind of tragic. Didn't really know where to put it. Contemplated littering. Uh, right as I was thinking it, some guy walked by and kind of like stared at me like he knew what I was thinking, and I was like, all right, <laughs> back off, right, chill out. Um, in all seriousness, I'd like to thank MIT, uh, my panelists, uh, and all of you for coming out. I hope it'll be a great conversation. I'm actually originally from New England. I was born in Massachusetts, uh, grew up between there and Connecticut, and though I defected to New York City, uh, I'm still a Patriots fan. I watched in awe as Brady led the Pats down the field one more time and then fumed as we were defeated by the Denver Broncos. I am still angry. Uh, my thoughts and prayers are not with them. Uh, however, growing up in New England was not always easy for me. Uh, I was a brown kid named Haroon, uh, which meant I was very easily identified. Uh, I remember we'd have substitute teachers. You know, they, they obviously have no idea who the students are, so they'd kind of go through the names and be like, Haroon, and I wanted to be like, really? Um, if you can't, like, why can you not find me right now? Um, if it's racist, if I say it, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I, as a result, I became a Lakers fan. Uh, I, I looked for someone I could identify with, and I identified Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He was Muslim like me, uh, but tall, famous, athletic, and wealthy, unlike me. Uh, but nevertheless, there was enough of a bridge there to, to feel attached. So I became a Lakers fan. I was a Lakers fan in Celtics country in the 1980s. I understood the clash of civilizations before it was even a thesis. Uh, and uh, I will go from there to say that, in many ways, no more appropriate analogy for modern Islam can be found. Uh, in the 1980s, the Lakers were, of course, great, but today things look and feel bleak. Uh, we, know we, know, we know we need to get rid of some folks on the roster. This I wrote before Kobe announced his retirement. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we also know that those folks, or folk, uh, is the only reason people come to Lakers games anymore and things pretty much look bleak. Uh, a great and glorious past is contrasted to a dismal present and a scary future summed up by our defeat at the hands of the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, which will not be commented on further. <laughs> it hurts, though. Today's topic is religion and violence. I will be talking about my religion, Islam. The religion we talk about so much, which we need to desperately, I think, better understand, but often don't get the conversations we need to or want to about. And I think that the inadequacy of many of our conversations about Islam and Muslims in the public sphere, by no means all of them, but some of them, uh, is ultimately, I think, not just hurtful or harmful to American Muslims or Muslims, but specifically uh, to America and to Americans at large. Uh, namely, what we do not know can hurt us. Uh, and bad information has formed the basis for bad policies and it is my hope to contribute in whatever small way to correcting that. 
I will start with the formulation, Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, I'm sure some of you or many of you have already heard this. I've actually been trying to track down who first said it. Uh, one of the first leads is actually President Bush, uh, who made the statement, Islam is a religion of peace, shortly after the September 11th attacks. Uh, since then, or perhaps at the same time and subsequently, it's been adopted by many Muslim commentators or apologists, if you want to be less char charitable about it, uh, who have proposed that Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, I'd like to investigate and interrogate that claim. Uh, but in order to do so, I want to start with a few questions. Uh, the first is, what do we mean when we say Islam is a religion of peace? Do we mean that Islam as a religious tradition, its core texts, and so on and so forth, the heart of the religion is what we would call peaceful or pacific, uh, or do we mean Islam as it is historically or presently practiced by Muslims, uh, a peaceful religion? In other words, are we talking about religion in a normative or idealistic sense, or are we talking about the religious themselves? Uh, we would get different answers. Mine is controversial, probably the only thing that will be quoted from today's talk, rendering me anathema in Muslim communities, uh, kind of like a Celtics fan at the Staples Center. Incidentally, I went to a Lakers game in uh, 2004, a finals game. It was like the mecca of my life. Uh, I, I, yes, I said that. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I went there, and I was so excited. It was like being home. Everyone was wearing purple and yellow, or as we like to say it, four and blue and gold, because we like to elevate ourselves a little bit. Uh, and also, incidentally, I noticed I was like the ugliest person in Los Angeles. Um, every city has sort of different strengths. Uh, mine was not really the strength that LA was looking for. Uh, uh, two friends of mine and I, all from Massachusetts, we spent about $800 each on tickets. We saved up like everything we had to go watch the Lakers in the finals. And as I was on the plane, I thought to myself, dear God, what happens if they lose? Right? Like what a miserable experience it would be to go all the way out there and then watch your team get defeated at the cost of you know, about $1,000 when you add in everything. Uh, as it was, the Lakers won the game in overtime but lost every other game in the finals. Uh, so be careful what you wish for. Uh, I have ADD, as you can tell. Uh, I will say this. I do not believe Islam is a religion of peace. You can quote me on that. You can tweet it out. I'll probably get a notification shortly. I do believe that the sum total of the Islamic tradition inclines to pacifism, but I do not believe that Islam is a religion of peace because clearly there are Islamic texts and practices which encourage or enable or legitimate violence. Uh, nevertheless, I don't think that's an exceptional statement because I can't think of a single religion or, or social system that does not, does not in some way, shape, or form uh, tolerate violence or even encourage violence. Uh, I think that's pretty much the case across most religious and ethical traditions. The question is what kind of violence and when and where. If we ask on the second level, uh, what do Muslims collectively do? Are Muslims peaceful people? Uh, then let me answer this question with some caveats. The overwhelming majority of Muslims condemn, reject, and detest groups like ISIS. Uh, they are on record. Many, if not most, of ISIS's recruits, not all of them, but most of them, display very little familiarity with the Islamic tradition. And those of us who work in counter-radicalization or counter-extremism know that the more you know about the Islamic religious tradition, the less likely you are to be swayed by ISIS propaganda. That said, nevertheless, ISIS calls itself Islamic. Obviously, it's right there in the name. Many of its fighters are clearly motivated by religion, or rather what they think their religion is or want their religion to be. Others use religion, and not just ISIS, as justification, motivation, or adornment for their actions. Uh, although ISIS is clearly the worst iteration of Islamic extremism, arguably. Actually, I don't think that's really arguable, but still. Uh, it is obviously not the only one. Uh, we have groups like Hezbollah, we have Boko Haram, we have obviously Al-Qaeda, uh, and other groups, many of which maybe you haven't heard of, like Lashkar Taiba, and so on and so forth. It would be immoral and dishonest, I think, for the world's Muslims to deny that Islam is used to justify violence and that a significant number of Muslims, although a minority, believe that their actions are religiously permissible, uh, and that's a problem for the world's Muslims. Nevertheless, I think it also worth asking what else causes violence and how to respond to this kind of violence. And so what I want to do in the second part of the talk, and I have lots of parts of the talk, most of which I'm making up as I go along, uh, mostly because I'm looking at the time and thinking, dear God, this is far too long. Um, we're going to end basically like halfway to a solution. Um, it's like my AP history class. We ended at the Vietnam War. Uh, and you know, as far as we knew, South Vietnam was on its way to rescue. Um, and uh, I, think, I think actually one of the AP questions was on Watergate. And you heard this collective what, um, which was kind of awesome. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, we took it up with the AP history professor, but what are you going to do, right? Anyway, LBJ is still our president. Things look good. 
Yes. What am I talking about? When I talk about solutions, I actually want to use the American Muslim community as a focus for them. Uh, because I think the American Muslim community's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Islam and violence is a very interesting one. On the one hand, America's Muslims are largely incidental and irrelevant to the world Muslim community in the sense that it is a very small population, very far away, that doesn't really weigh in on a lot of religious conversations because it isn't perceived to have a lot of authority or expertise or simply the numbers or history to count. Some of this is unfair, nevertheless it is largely true. At the same time, American Muslims as Americans have a far greater effect than they realize on the Muslim world by virtue of our participation or theoretical participation in American politics and policies. So what I will say is that American Muslims, even though I would not argue that anyone bears a collective responsibility for crimes such as extremism, nevertheless will be held accountable for them. And this is the unfortunate reality of the world we live in today. Uh, I don't know if those of you who saw the New York Post, the shift in the cover over the course of last night after the attack in San Bernardino, uh, it went from, I think, you know, something on, on murder and mayhem to Muslim killers. So the cover of the most popular news daily in New York City was Muslim killers. Uh, so obviously, if you were Muslim, you bear some degree of, uh, shall we say, implication in that title. Uh, and therefore, it is important for American Muslims to think about what to do. It is also important, I think, for American Muslims to realize that groups like ISIS, although they represent a minority of Muslims, nevertheless use specifically social media and create the ability to recruit globally. So although it is a minority phenomenon, thanks to social media and new media, they are able to basically insert themselves into conversations, theoretically, almost anywhere in the world. Anyone has a phone or a laptop or an internet connection. As such, you see small numbers of radicalized Muslims, nevertheless, in all different places in the world. And the question is, what do we do about this? And this is where I think we get to the most interesting question of religion and violence, which is our own interconnected politics and how religion and foreign policy tend to work in a kind of seesaw or rubber band effect. One pulls on the other and the other snaps in place and we go back and forth. So we have this ongoing conversation on is Islam a religion of peace or is Islam a religion of terror instead of asking what I think is far more important, namely what policies or practices make violence more or less likely. Uh, because at the end of the day, obviously people have agency, but the kinds of choices you have, the options you believe you have in front of you, and the kind of conversations you'll even hear will shape that agency in a very significant way. In other words, no one lives in a vacuum. Yep, page three. Historically, the Muslim world had to basically deal with a set of challenges, even contradictions. If you examine any religious scripture, it contains what we might politely call tensions or contradictions. Islam's is no different. One can open up the Muslim holy book and find all kinds of verses. There are some verses which seem to encourage violence and a larger number which seem to encourage restraint. How do you make sense of these? Many times anti-Muslim propaganda functions in the exact same way as extremist propaganda. Namely, it picks and chooses verses from the Quran in order to make an argument about what Islam is or is not. Historically, what Muslims did is they basically came up with mechanisms to reconcile these different texts. It took several centuries to build that edifice and it dominated most Muslim conversations about Islam for about a thousand years. In the last two or 300 years, that edifice has fallen apart. The consensus has collapsed. There is a vacuum of religious authority at the same time that there is a vacuum of political authority. In that environment, you see competing, even contradictory interpretations of what religion is and is not. And the problem the world's Muslims have is that there is no easy mechanism by which to collectively answer or rebut extremist arguments because the institutions do not exist to leverage those sentiments. In other words, even if the world's Muslims as a majority condemn or reject extremism, they have no way to leverage those sentiments into actionable policy. Largely because many of them, especially those most afflicted, live in countries whose governments are completely unconcerned with their sentiments. And so as such, you have this apparent paradox that the majority of the world's Muslims reject extremist groups and yet seem to be able to do nothing about them. And a small minority of Muslims is able to project an image or idea of Islam which is extremely dangerous. The question now comes to how we solve this or how we address this. And one of the things we must understand in solving and addressing this problem is that our own policy choices are implicated. 
that we have not made constructive choices either as a country, and that our own choices actually in many ways have a far greater impact on the Muslim world than most Muslim institutions could ever hope to have. Which is not necessarily a fault of anyone, simply the fact that the United States is by far the world's most powerful country and is able to exert and leverage and use force in ways that almost no other country could even conceive of. And so even if our intentions are good, our actions will end up being bad or dangerous or harmful, not just to people in certain regions, but to we ourselves. And that's where I want to talk a little bit about the nature of the conversation about Islam today in the American public sphere. When we talk about groups like ISIS, I hope it is beyond argument that groups like this need to be defeated. They need to be attacked, contained, and destroyed. How we do that is a matter of debate, and it's an important debate. But whether or not we should do that should not, I hope, be a debate. It's the same to me, although on a different scale, as arguing that the Nazis needed to be defeated and destroyed. Nevertheless, as we have this debate, we should keep a point in mind. Had World War I ended differently, there may not have been a Nazi Germany. That doesn't absolve Nazis from what they did or mean we didn't have to fight them, but it means that we should learn from historical examples to talk about what we're supposed to do next. And so when we look at a group like ISIS, let's not forget where ISIS emerged and in what context it emerged. Iraq is a country that was created by Western colonialism. It was three provinces cobbled together by force with no participation from the peoples living in those three provinces. In the last 100 years exactly, Iraq has been invaded four times by Western forces. And if we count the current escalating conflict as an invasion or a war, that would be the fifth. Most Iraqis have not known anything but war since the Carter administration. They have lived in an asymmetric atmosphere of total war, starvation, sanction, sectarianism, and brutality, whether indigenous or from abroad or from the region, for the greater part of four decades. Is it really surprising that an apocalyptic movement would take hold in a region suffering what feels like total war? Are we surprised that after decades of war, we do not have a genteel civil society movement, but a radical extremist movement? And if we keep that in mind, what should our next policy choices be? And is it fair to have a conversation about religion and violence in a vacuum, or should we consider about the interaction of religion, policy, violence, and peace as factors that all shape one another. And when we look at many of the conversations we have about Islam in the public sphere in the United States, most of these are inadequate or inaccurate. They don't do what we want them to do, which is to inform us. So as an example, a prominent interpreter of modern Islam is Ayan Hirsi Ali. Her only expertise is that she suffered undoubtedly terrible things growing up in a Muslim household. We have given her the authority to pronounce on Islam, which is in effect no different than allowing a Palestinian who grew up under Israeli occupation to use that experience to enable and justify and maintain a collective judgment on all of Judaism. We allow ourselves to say things about Islam that we would not necessarily be comfortable saying about things we know better about or topics we are more familiar with or causes or concerns that we think better of. And ultimately, the reason I think that is dangerous is because it harms us as America. In 2002 and 2003, as we ran up to the Iraq War, one of the reasons why I think it was possible for many Americans to believe that there was a connection between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, both brutal men but with very different ideologies and worldviews, is because it was easy for us to believe they're all the same. When you don't have nuanced arguments or ideas, you fall prey to narratives that collectivize and in the end harm. 
We have lost, because of the Iraq War, thousands of American soldiers' lives, tens of thousands who were injured, many of whom for life, hundreds of billions of dollars, and the region is even more unstable than it is now. The war on terror has not been a success. By most metrics, it's been a failure. We have more extremism, more unstable regions, more violence, and less sense of what we can do about it. So my concern in these conversations is that we introduce into conversations about religion and violence the kind of nuance we apply to our own societies and cultures and apply these equally across the board. Not simply because we miss things about these religions themselves, but because we can put ourselves in a position of making bad decisions, which we will continue to pay the price for. Thank you very much. So first, let me express my appreciation for the ability to come back to MIT. I get invited here periodically, I think because I have friends like Steve Van Evera, whom I've known for years and years. I thought we ought to start with Steve on the causes of war. He knows more about that than anybody else in the human history. And then we could talk about religion and violence in light of that. But however, we are here on a different purpose, but I'm delighted to be back and honored to be on the platform with an old friend, Steve, and a new friend, Haroon. So my purpose in addressing uh, in 20 minutes the question of religion and violence is to warn you that this is uh, what Dr. Johnson used to call the broad brush approach to history. So I will, uh, in the beginning, make the point that conversation about these issues is absolutely essential. Not only because we need conversation about war, peace, and politics, but we need conversation when religion intersects with war, peace, and politics. Religious traditions are cumulative. So as Haroon said, the more we know, the better we understand. And, the, and a cumulative traditions that go back centuries, it takes time to understand where it has come from and where it stands. Secondly, religious traditions, however, as cumulative are also living. They change over time. The degree to which they change varies with religious traditions, with the structure of authority, with scholarship, with experience, but they are living and therefore, to use a phrase that it comes out of my own tradition, there is always development of doctrine where continuity and change come together in a religious tradition. Thirdly, religious religions are historical, so they are affected not only by their own internal dynamic, they are affected, as Haroon has made the point, by external circumstances. All of that is background to addressing, it seems to me, religion and violence. What I will try to do is to speak out of the Christian tradition. I'll use three steps. First of all, religion and violence, the, to the topic uh, that we have been given. Secondly, I want to distinguish religion and violence from religiously based violence. And then thirdly, I'd like to go from the past to the present on this question. Religion and violence, what I mean here is what happens when religion faces violence. Now violence itself is a multi-dimensional term. We talk about domestic violence, awful in itself, civil violence, and then global violence, the specific case of international relations. I'm using the term violence in terms of war because it seems to me war crystallizes one of the central questions religion faces. War may be many things, but it is always the systematic, planned, conscious, purposeful use of force which can involve the large-scale taking of human life. That's the nature of the moral problem that war places before religion. In the Christian tradition, there have been two kinds of war that have been justified at various times. The, time, the kind that is most often talked about today is a live topic, a living topic, is the just war tradition, which has run through Catholicism since the fifth century and run through the Christian tradition in its pluralism uh, since at least the 11th and the 16th century. But there has also been, as part of the Christian tradition, holy war. 
And so we need to look at both dimensions of that when we look at religion and violence. Let me turn first to when religion faces violence. That is to say, I'm trying to say here that if you live within a religious tradition, a religious community, and you live in a world where violence occurs, how should religious believers respond? What I'm addressing is how Christians respond. Faced with the fact of war, Christians split into two broad groups. The first position that was taken is normally discussed as pacifism and nonviolence. The terms, however, are distinct. They are often simply collapsed, but that's not really accurate. Pacifism it basically pay, places war outside the moral religious universe. That is to say, pacifism believes that war and Christian faith are contradictory ideas. And in the face of war, one must resist. One must not participate. One must advocate not going to war. One may advocate then the second step, and that is nonviolent strategies. Nonviolence is both a philosophy and a strategy. But it, the reason you can't collapse nonviolence and pacifism is pacifism has a strict philosophical answer that says the use of force is always wrong. People who practice nonviolence vary. Some are pacifists, some are not. From South Africa to Poland, nonviolence was used by a range of people, some pacifists, some not. So faced with the fact of violence, uh, some Christians adopted from the earliest days non-participation. Well then, where did the just war tradition arise? The essential pacifist assertion, as I said, places war outside the, the moral universe. Interestingly enough, classical realism in its political form, in a sense, places war outside the moral universe too, at least some classical realism. So you all remember the Malayan dialogue, where the Greek generals say to the Malayans, uh, come now, let us have no talk about justice. Let us have no talk about morality. Let us talk about the world as it is. And in the world as it is, the strong do what they will, and the weak do what they must. Pacifism places war outside the moral universe on religious and moral grounds. Classical realism places war outside the moral universe on the basis that the nature, dynamic, and stakes of war are such there is no room for what you might call moral, moral imagination. So the question about where the just war argument comes from. Well, to some degree, it is simplistic, but in a short period of time, it fits between pacifism and realism. With the pacifist, it begins with an assumption that the use of force is not a good way to resolve political and human problems. But that assumption, it can be overridden in specific cases. So the function of the just war ethic is to determine under what circumstances war might be justified. Now this tradition was originally a religiously based tradition that then became argued in philosophical terms in the Middle Ages, and then became part of the foundation of international law. So the just war tradition, essentially, its assertion is some uses of force are morally justifiable, not all uses of force are morally justifiable. It is a tradition, therefore, that is grounded in a religious vision, but today is used in purely secular reasoning in secular institutions and becomes part of our present tense dialogue on religion, morality, and war. If you look at, for example, the UN's Declaration on Responsibility to Protect, the categories of when that is justified come directly out of just war teaching. I've had the privilege of lecturing at the National War College for over 25 years now, where this topic is discussed in some detail in terms of uh, what, uh, what uh, politics and strategy mean in a universe in which the measurement of war 
is moral as well as political and strategic. By the Middle Ages, you had a set of categories that carry forward to the present time. So in the Christian tradition, beside the pacifist tradition, you have the just war tradition which says, essentially, the only justifiable use of force must be a limited use of force. It must be limited in its purposes. Not every reason justifies war. It must be limited in its means. Even in a justifiable conflict, there are limits to what can be done. The outstanding one, that the direct targeting of civilians is always wrong under all circumstances and seeks to, to protect a deontological claim in the midst of a larger doctrine that is consequentialist in its outcome. So limited in its purposes, limited in its methods, and limited in its intentions. At least in this tradition, out of its religious foundation, war is fought as a tragedy with sorrow. It cannot be fought with hatred, nor revenge, nor violence for the sake of violence. It is always a tragedy. And the function of the just war doctrine is to preserve tragedy from becoming sinful. That is to say, wars that are fought for purposes that are unjustifiable, fought in methods that are unjustifiable, or fought with intentions that are unjustifiable. However, the whole story is not between the pacifist and the just war. There was a tradition of holy war in the Christian Catholic tradition. Holy war is war fought for faith and declared by some religious authority. Sometimes it was argued it was fought to defend the faith against enemies. Other times it was said it was fought to discipline those within the community that threatened the community. The main point I would make here is that while just war has a history that starts in the fifth century and continues today, the holy war tradition, which needs to be acknowledged, very much in the style that, her, 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 <coughs> that Harun said, the holy war tradition starts with Augustine in the fifth century and it ends with Vittoria in the 16th century. For Vittoria essentially says, Difference of religion cannot be the cause of war. The cause of war must be a moral fault, a huge moral evil being done that can only be resisted by some use of force. That's where you get the last resort category, the limited methods and limited purposes. So holy war, which then became a crusade in the Middle Ages, Holy war has been part of the Christian tradition. I would argue it is no longer part of the Christian tradition in terms of the tradition. Here again, a footnote from Harun. When we talk about religious traditions, you always have to distinguish between what the tradition holds and what people who hold the tradition do. So there, it is impossible uh, in the best of traditions to restrain people from violating the tradition in its best uh, assertion and language. I would argue the holy war tradition in terms of authorization uh, uh, ended uh, in the 16th century. And particularly in terms of a religion that does have an authoritative voice, uh, Francis, if anything, has put a resounding exclamation point around that question of the end of that tradition. But there have been Christians since the 16th century that have fought wars that were unjustifiable and were, in fact, appealed to as holy wars. So religion and violence in the Christian tradition divided into justifiable war, unjustifiable war under any circumstances, pacifism, and then the holy war tradition, which needs to be acknowledged but not accept it. That brings us to the question of how you move from the past to the present. Now, when you move from the past to the present and seek to discuss religion and violence, you open up a very broad canvas, a broad canvas that goes beyond the religious communities, and a broad canvas that is very much studied in this institution as well as mine down the street and many other places. Because here the discussion 
is about politics, strategy, religion, and war. So one needs to recognize that today war is invoked in the name of religion in more than one place and in more than one tradition. Now, memory here is very important, and I think very important for the Western world. We need to remember that we had a period of time in which war was married to religion. The wars of religion are always too simple an explanation. There were more factors than just religion. But Christians managed to kill one-third of the population of Central Europe around religious questions married to politics and other things. This is not a new chapter in the history of religion or the history of war. But we need to recognize that war is invoked in the name of religion. And when you marry war to religion, you double the complexity, the danger of war. War is complicated enough in itself. Steve can instruct us. Religion is complicated enough in itself. You marry the two together, and what you get is a witch's brew. Because if anything is needed for good politics, good strategy, and good morality, it is a sense of restraint. And when religion is invoked, it tends to pull into the discussion transcendent claims that seem self-evident to those who invoke them. Therefore, the essential argument that if war ever is to be justified, it must be limited, is the first thing that goes out the window. Because if you're sure you know the mind of God, you don't think you need to consult an ethicist. So the, the question is that, that immediately we need to recognize that. Secondly, we need to recognize that as religion and war are married to each other, it really is part of a larger picture about how international affairs is understood. The modern era of international affairs roughly dates from the 17th century. We call it the Westphalian tradition and the Westphalian treaty. I'll never forget a conference I was at with Les Aspen, the former Secretary of Defense, and I brought up the Treaty of Westphalia, and Les said, the guy next to me said, was that before or after SALT I? And so, <laughs> but we have learned, we have, that was a long time ago, and we have learned to refer to Westphalia. Because the Westphalian tradition had two consensual characteristics, I would argue it has three real characteristics. The Westphalian tradition was about the sovereignty of states, the principle of non-intervention, and the third, implicit but real, was the secularization of war and politics. That is to say, the attempt to radically separate religion from war and politics. Now that tradition uh, has been undergirding world politics for four, cent four centuries, basically. And if you look at the UN Charter, uh, admission to the UN means you're a sovereign state, and it always presumed non-intervention. What we need to recognize today is that all three dimensions of the Westphalian order are under pressure. Not canceled out, but under pressure. Sovereignty is threatened by globalization, or at least confronted by it. Transnational ties across state lines are part and parcel of our life, economically, politically, and in transnational violence, uh, strategically. Non-intervention was basically rightfully corrected, I think, in the debate about the responsibility to protect. The responsibility to protect limits both sovereignty and expands the possibility of intervention. The secularity dimension, keep religion out, is today precisely what we're talking about. Religion is now in the discussion of war and politics. So how think about where we are. I would rather keep war and politics secular in character, harnessed by moral arguments, but not woven through with religion. However, that is probably not a choice that's open to us now. 
the discussion is open about religion, war, and politics. Appeals are made that were made at other times in history. So the only way to deal with this dimension is precisely to bring it into the open, to bring it into conversation, to set, seek to set limits on what people do by normative characteristics and normative categories. There are three kinds of norms that function in world politics, religious norms, moral norms, and legal norms. We need to use all three now because the discussion has broken across these lines. Secondly, there is wisdom in the just war argument that it is unlikely that we can extirpate war from human affairs. It may be possible in principle. It is not likely in fact. Different people told us that. Augustine in the 5th century, uh, realists in the 20th century, and followers of both. And therefore, the idea of limiting the use of force normatively is necessary. It preserves force as an instrument for extreme cases. Augustine basically, I think, was right. He said, war is the result of sin, and in a sinful world, it is necessary to have the instrument of coercion available. My pacifist Christians, my pacifist friends, really always make the same case. They say what the just war doctrine tries to do is to legitimate war in some circumstances and always limit it. They say what you end up doing is legitimating war and never limiting it. It's a critique that has to be taken seriously. But my view that you have to discuss now religion and war openly, matched with keeping alive the just war tradition which sets limits on war and keeps the use of force as a possibility. The third step is to recognize that within my own tradition, uh, people have narrowed the just war even more stringently than it has ever been narrowed before in terms of what passes justification. And they've tried to match it with what's called peace building. You hear about peacekeeping from the UN or peace enforcement, chapter six and seven. Peace building is the effort of non-governmental groups seeking to work in this transnational way across lines to both participate in preventive diplomacy and reconciliation. So Francis's visit to a mosque this week in a highly dangerous situation He's trying to set a direction for his church. I think it does not expunge the just war tradition, but we need more peace building from religion, more conversation about war politics and strategy, and a very wise use of force when we think it is both justified and necessary. Thank you. There are many, many uh, questions and comments out there. I'll start by asking both uh, Brian and Haroon to um, develop further their thoughts on solutions. We heard Brian just now saying that we need to do is thicken norms that govern the use of force. And to, uh, you're offering a Westphalian idea here to separate the use of force from the world of religion more, more firmly. Those are broad. Um, mm. Up in the air, beautiful ideas. How do we bring them down to earth Steve's and make them alive? Steve's been telling me this for years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, tell I, me in specific. Well, I, I think you. Let me I, let me just let me just put okay. two ideas on the All table. Right. I want to hear reactions to them. I always like to sort of uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Let's look at successful things that happened in the past and ask if they teach us anything about where to go today. And the two sort of lenses for looking for success I would put on the table. One would be Vatican II. Um, which I think of the whole reform of Catholic teaching about the Jewish people in the 60s was, you can think I'm you know, dreaming here, but uh, the Catholic world really changed completely its teaching about its relationship with the Jews in the 60s under the leadership of Pope John XXIII in a way that was very deep, very enduring, very dramatic, had, and very effective. Before that time, the Catholic Church routinely preached and taught against the Jews uh, off and on with differing degrees of intensity, but as you say, it went on and on. 
How did that come about, and what lessons can we learn about, if you will, an internal reform success uh, for um, the larger question of how can religious communities be redirected toward um, uh, more tolerance and more respect for one another? A second lens um, I'd like to hear both of you talk about is, you know, you spoke with some frustration about how do we organize dialogue in which those who are abusing religious authority um, have to, if you will, answer the tough questions and have to hear themselves criticized in a public domain where everyone can hear. Uh, the way religious dialogue happens across the planet is it's basically an inward discussion amongst uh, sub-communities. And uh, the sub-communities don't hear each other's criticism and don't have to react to it. And their own flock and followers often really never find out how unhinged their leaders are if they are unhinged. So how do we create a more common dialogue about um, about uh, the correct way for faith communities to think about their faiths and uh, a common dialogue in which those who abuse religious authority for hate uh, have to face criticism for it. And again, to me, I like to look at examples where this has been sort of done with some success. I look at Human Rights Watch, okay, which created a global dialogue about human rights in which human rights abusers had to face a permanent climate of criticism and accountability when they abuse uh, human rights. Uh, uh, it was a new thing when Human Rights Watch started out, and I think they've had a huge impact, the sort of naming and shaming strategy. Maybe we're missing an NGO here. What about Religious Hate Watch? Why don't we try to institutionalize uh, a dialogue about uh, the use of religious authority for hate uh, on a planet-wide scale that would be general in nature and in which essentially a NGO would take on the job of doing what you're calling for here. Let's uh, let's have those who do, uh, and you were pointing out how wildly ISIS you know, abuses and uh, misreads and misrepresents mainstream Islam, uh, but does it without uh, the criticism of its actions much reaching its audience. Well, can, we, can we create institutions that will make a dialogue happen and, and cause uh, the flock to be more aware that uh, what these folks are saying is, is, is wrong? So um, two, two points, uh, Vatican II, lessons, uh, an NGO missing, uh, or, or if you have other thoughts on how to bring about the dialogue that you, I thought, implicitly called for in your talk. Well, uh, let, me, let me go for it. At some point, I want to come back to your point about up in the air and down on the ground, okay. because no. I, don't, I don't want to walk away accused of that no. without no. a response. <laughs> so, but I'll come to that later. <laughs> OK, so uh, what, happened, uh, what happened at Vatican II in terms of the Jewish people is, again, what in Catholicism we call development of doctrine. That is to say, a previous conception of ideas were found to be wanting or outright wrong, or usually described as incomplete, and they were, the ideas were taken and refashioned. In fact, as important as that one was, the major development of doctrine at Vatican II was the doctrine on religious liberty. Catholicism had never given an in-principled affirmation to the idea that everyone had the right to religious liberty, because coming out of the medieval period and the post-reformation period, the idea was that if you say that, then you're really saying there is no such thing as religious truth. People have no obligation to search for the truth, and therefore you're just, you're, you're just eroding the idea of religion. That, uh, that was due to, overwhelmingly due to an American Jesuit, John Courtney Murray, uh, was the person who, for advocating precisely that change, was forbidden to teach in our tradition for about 15 years, and then came back as the author of the Declaration of Religious Liberty at the Council. So there can be development. There's been developments uh, in, in terms of the ethics of war. Uh, Augustine was big on the purposes of war and the authority of who could, who could fight it. In the 20th century, the dominant question in the ethics of war, as you know, is about limitation of means a topic that was not there before. If you look at the impact of that in terms of contemporary real life affairs, uh, I assign an article all the time in my course, and we'll do it again this spring, a 1944 article by another Jesuit uh, named John Ford who condemned obliteration bombing in World War II. He took on Bomber Harris in a 30-page article in which he said the, the, the fight to, to defeat Hitler is just. The method being used is wrong. 
And he also, at the end of the article, he had just a hint. He said, we've crossed the line now. We've crossed the line on obliteration bombing, and we essentially will grow to regret it. Now, I always think of that sentence when I read McGeorge Bundy's account uh, of, uh, of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Bundy said, in the US government, when the question came up about dropping the atomic bomb, no one, no one in the upper reaches of the American government said it is wrong to bomb civilians. He said that had been bypassed in Dresden, in Tokyo. We forgot a moral principle. But today, I would argue it's virtually impossible to fight a war where you don't have to answer for uh, civilian casualties. And you have to answer in many different ways. It doesn't stop it. So I think you can have developments inside religion. You can have developments where religion develops a principle and presses it, and it gets joined on the outside. The final point is about interreligious dialogue. The difference between now and the post-Reformation period is in the post-Reformation period, the leadership led the charge of the conflict. If you look at situations like the Balkans, look at some of the internal wars in Africa, the leadership says the right things. It can't control what's down below the leadership. It, you just, you just, if you, in the Balkans, you had Orthodox Christians, Catholics, and Muslims working together at the top level, but they couldn't control down below. If you look at, in, if you look at, uh, at the Central African Republic today, it's a very good example. There are three religious leaders. Francis went to give them publicity to some degree. The economists called them the saints. They, it's, a, it's an imam, Catholic bishop, and I think a Protestant uh, leader. But they can't control the forces. So I've talked long enough. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, when it comes to Muslim communities and institutions, I think the problem is, uh, we can all hear, yeah. Um, so I, I think the problem, you probably heard this meme, for lack of a better term, that Islam needs a reformation. Uh, it's, it's sort of a, it's a, one of the worst ideas out there. Uh, because the, the problem is Islam had a reformation. Uh, it's called Wahhabism. Uh, the reason Islam did not have a counter-reformation is because it was too busy getting colonized. Uh, so while it's, it's sort of, and I'm not saying one thing causes the other. I mean, there, a lot of different historical processes were happening at the same time which led to sort of, as Brian was pointing out, there was a collapse of religious authority and political authority, uh, meaning that even if people had good sentiments, they really you know, didn't know what to do with them because there was no real mechanism for translating them into uh, policy. Uh, in many ways, I think the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and I, I don't like making historical analogies like this because they're so imprecise, but in many ways, it, it, it augurs for Islam kind of like what the fall of Rome was for, for Europe. Uh, this is our dark ages. Uh, and I think a lot of Muslims haven't come to terms with that. But, but this is what we're seeing, and it's probably going to get worse. Uh, because our institutions are just in free fall. Uh, our leaders are, are less like Aragorn and more like Saruman. Um, and and you know, that's basically where we're at. right? And, and that's a very humbling and, and distressing uh, uh, scenario, but that's the reality of it. Uh, what that does mean, though, is that this is also an opportunity for people uh, with a little bit of moral common sense to step forward and to change the conversation, because if they don't, then no one will. Or someone, will, someone worse will step in and, and change the conversation. Um, uh, the idea of an NGO, actually I wrote a piece a few weeks ago saying that we basically need to build an alternative caliphate. I don't mean a political state. I mean uh, a set of institutions uh, regionally and globally that can produce positive change in the world, not politically, but financially, socially, culturally, so on and so forth. Because at the end of the day, if all Muslims do is say is condemn terrorism or say ISIS is bad, uh, that doesn't do anything. Uh, and it doesn't answer their talking points. Uh, because the reason the ISIS narrative is appealing is because it offers uh, disillusioned young people this romantic and demented vision at the same time that they can affect change in the world. And they can be powerful. And they can build a state. They're, they're being asked to do something. And the tragic reality is ISIS and Al-Qaeda are some of the few meritocracies in the Muslim world. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you will be brought in and you can build a state. Uh, it's distressing and disgusting what they're doing, but one must understand why it has appeal. Uh, because there are no alternatives to it that are able to capture the imagination of people. And, and that's on the world Muslim community to come up ways, ways to answer these, these 
narratives and these questions. So are you upset about what's happening in Syria? Are you upset about Palestine? Are you upset about Chechnya, so on and so forth? Here is something constructive and positive to do about it. Instead of just saying what they're doing is bad, now sit there and be quiet. It doesn't really do anything for you. Um, the, the second point I'll, I'll bring up, though, is, is on, on, on human rights and, and these questions is, I'll disagree a little bit with Brian. Um, I don't really care in an international political sense what your motivations are. Uh, I care what the actions are. So whether it's a secular theory of just war or a religious theory of just war, I'm more interested in the outcomes or behaviors. Uh, most Muslim governments and regimes incorporate religion into their uh, rationale for existence. Uh, that's simply a fact. Uh, that's not how American Muslims perceive the world. American Muslims overwhelmingly tend to be secular because they're Americans. Uh, but the fact of the matter is Tunisia, which is described as one of the most secular states in the Arab world, Islam is the state religion. Uh, right now in the Muslim world, you've got an Islamist government in Turkey fighting uh, an Islamist government in Iran, fighting an Islamist government in Saudi Arabia, fighting an Islamist insurgency called uh, ISIS, fighting an Islamist regime in Egypt, which is fighting an Islamist political party called the Muslim Brotherhood. Basically, everyone hates everyone, but they're all Muslim. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that religion is part of these, basically religion is, is grounds for difference and division more than it is for unity. And so there needs to be within religious communities some conversation on what are our human rights? Uh, what are norms for behavior and treatment of the other? Uh, whether you believe in your inalienable rights as an American because God created you that way, or it's a secular reason, doesn't really matter to me as long as you, you, know, you basically you believe in them. How you get to human rights is, you know, that's your own business and your own rationale as long as you're getting there. Um, and the other reason I bring it up, and I think it's dangerous, is that when we, when we remove, uh, when, when we say that secular violence is less dangerous than religious violence, I think that's historically and factually untrue. Um, I think that violence is just violence. And it doesn't matter why you're doing it, because you're still doing it. Um, so it doesn't matter if you nuked Hiroshima and Nagasaki because you believe God told you to, or because you believe that the war would end faster. The fact is you just did it, and it's wrong. Uh, so that's to me is a danger. I mean, we, we are pumping weapons into Saudi Arabia right now, even as we're asking Muslims to condemn ISIS, right? Like literally three days after Paris, Obama announced a $1.2 billion weapons sale to Saudi Arabia. Like you can't fight ISIS while you're funding the religious regime that basically creates the doctrine behind it. It doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's not good policy and it's, it's dangerous and it's immoral. So I think where we need to get in terms of resolving this in the immediate short term is kind of like you said, a religious hate watch. Human Rights Watch, I think, is the perfect analogy, right? Their naming and shaming, I don't really care if you call yourself the Islamic Republic of Iran or the Bahlavi monarchy of Iran, as long as you are agreeing to human rights, right? Whatever you call it, however you get there, let's get to a standard of, of commensurate treatment and an idea that all human beings have equal dignity. And, and that, to me, is the foundation for a solution. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, does anybody have a question? Uh, uh, over here. Or a, share a thought. Hi. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the whole secular violence thing because um, I am kind of want to bring it back to we're talking about religion and violence today. Um, and I want to ask, um, today in the world, is that really the biggest thing, like from a utilitarian perspective, or is that really killing more people? than other movements? And is there sort of possibly an outsize focus on that that's also leading to bad policy? Like one of the things that's, I, I looked at this chart this morning from the Syrian, uh, from a Syrian human rights group showing how many people had been killed by the, um, by the Assad government versus ISIS. And it's in more order of like two magnitudes higher. It's like a hundred times more people have been killed. It's like hundreds of thousands as opposed to a few thousand. So are we focusing on the wrong thing? Is that actually perpetuating these problems? I guess I'll go with that. Uh, you know, when, when I talked earlier, thank you for the question, when I talked earlier about fighting ISIS, this is what I would propose that we ask our politicians. Uh, give us your military strategy and give us your political strategy. Because it's, it's unfair to the American military to say, we're gonna go send you into a war and we don't really know why. I mean, to say the least, the unfair is perhaps a really nice word for it, right? We'll send you into Iraq, but we don't really have any idea what we're supposed to get out of this, right? That's not. The Iraq war didn't work out, it, it didn't not work out because the military couldn't do it, it's because nobody really told the military what to do, right? So when it comes to ISIS, for example, and this kinds of violence, I mean, look, we can bomb ISIS, sure, but probably what's gonna happen? Uh, they'll go somewhere else and regroup somewhere else, right? They have branches in Syria and Yemen, so on and so forth, and then we're gonna be playing whack-a-mole, right? 
So that's not a particularly good military strategy. Um, you mentioned Assad and this violence. The only way to really destroy ISIS, I mean, obviously there's a military component to it, is you need a political solution to Syria. Um, you need some kind of power sharing agreement that gets everyone basically believing that they have a stake uh, in the future of Syria and that they will be, the, the, yeah, the, the, all these different communities, Sunni, Shia, uh, Alawi, whatever they are, to basically believe they have a state and for major world powers to feel like no one's being basically uh, ignored or, or maligned. And so when it comes to different kinds of violence, I, I agree with you. Um, when you focus only on ISIS, you forget that there's, other, there's a reason that ISIS is sustained. And I think Russia is making it worse now because most of Russia's bombing has been against non-ISIS Sunni rebels. There's about 30,000 ISIS fighters and about 70 to 80,000 uh, Sunni rebel fighters. Uh, if they're being bombed by the Assad regime and by Russia and they're fighting ISIS, probably what's going to happen? They're not going to join Assad, right? Um, they have nowhere to go. They'll probably end up joining ISIS. Uh, so that's not a good strategy, right? And that's why you know, there needs to be some sort of solution beyond let's go to war. The solution has to be here's how we're going to stop ISIS from being able to take a foothold. I, um, I guess I would disagree with Harun. Uh, ideas do make a difference. Uh, this is not only about outcomes. It's how you get to outcomes. And uh, religion can't solve this problem, and religion is not the only source of the problem. But if you eliminate the capability of religious ideas to interact with political strategic ideas, you give away the game. And that seems to me to be a wrong idea. The idea of protecting civilians did not come first from a secular authority. It was argued on the basis of human dignity and the idea that those who do not do harm should not be attacked. It became a wider uh, strategic and legal. But I would say that uh, there's no question that secular violence has been awful. Uh, I simply mean that it complicates the scene even more, uh, 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 even more deeply when you resurface religion, politics, and strategy. Uh, I think limits are very important in world politics. Limits being boundaries, limits being ideas, limits being uh, uh, understandings that uh, conflict may be woven into the human situation, but the kind of conflict that we have seen in the 20th century and before doesn't have to be repeated. There. I don't know if I should ask. I don't know if I should ask a question about religion or basketball, but I'll start with religion. Uh, as far as uh, Relig uh, holy war and their uh, religious violence goes, it goes back well before the start of Islam and Christianity. Uh, the Old Testament is replete with uh, violence. It's probably the most <laughs> violence-strewn uh, set of books on the face of the planet. Joshua is probably the original terrorist, maybe the worst one ever since then. But we're still not coming into grips with the question of whether religion is really relevant to the violence, whether or not that violence would have been more or less uh, without religion, uh, because as you've noted, that uh, the uh, secular violence uh, that's taken over recently has been waged in the, uh, under the uh, uh, name of uh, secular ideologies, which has far exceeded anything that religious, uh, religion did in the past. So without religion, would uh, the violence of the past uh, been less? Or with uh, religion, uh, could we have uh, done uh, less in uh, forms of secular violence in the present? For myself, I, I think violence is rooted in more than one place. So I don't know that I can empirically answer the question whether there'd be more or less violence if there was, if there was or was not religion. But religion, uh, but I think violence is, you can argue, violence is partially rooted in human nature. It is partially rooted in the way political regimes function. And it's partially rooted in what is traditionally called the anarchy of world politics. So that's not a new argument. I'm drawing on sources people will automatically recognize. So I think that, once again, I don't think religion causes all the violence. I don't think it can solve it. I think it is woven through history. And it can be, within history, a limiting force on both the evil that where violence responds to and the evil that is unprovoked violence.
Uh, I mean, I, I guess I would just add, uh, you know, religious beliefs obviously change, but, you know, even as we talk about religion encouraging violence, religion also inhibits violence. Uh, in 1987, uh, the CIA was working with uh, Afghan Mujahideen, as we call them, uh, against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, there was a tunnel uh, connecting Kabul to northern regions uh, through which the Soviets brought uh, their military supplies. So basically one ring road uh, around Afghanistan built by Soviet engineers. Uh, and this tunnel, the Salang Tunnel, you can look it up, S-A-L-A-N-G, uh, was the route through which you know, these major military supplies would come in. Uh, and the CIA proposed a mission in which you know, a, a truck bomber would go in and blow himself up in the tunnel you know, with a truck bomb with sufficient explosives uh, to destroy the tunnel. Uh, the idea being that once you destroyed the tunnel, uh, you know, the Soviets would basically be unable to bring in uh, sufficient supplies to resupply their military. And uh, long story short, they couldn't find a single Afghan uh, who, would, who was willing to do it because they all said suicide is against our religion. Uh, so even though it was seen as a tactical necessity, and one could make a religious argument, I suppose, for saying that, hey, if you do this, if one person sacrifices his life, then your country is you know, theoretically greatly advanced in its struggle for liberation, or however you want to frame it, uh, and couldn't do it. Today, you know, we seem to be suffering the opposite problem. Uh, that's a, you know, less than, you know, what is that, like just a couple decades. Uh, so under 30 years. So you know, obviously religion and how we perceive violence changes. Uh, I agree with you. I think, that, I think that fundamentally violence is just a, human, uh, a way that humans relate to each other. Uh, how we justify it and, and what language we use doesn't really matter to me because ultimately it's embedded in our own value system and how we rationalize it. Uh, right now, if you look at extremist groups in the Muslim world, uh, they're, they are pushing back, they're being pushed back by religious scholars and they have been forced to change some of their strategies or tactics uh, or have attempted to because of the pushback. Nearly all of that pushback is being done in religious language. Uh, so it is a debate over what religion is supposed to be. Uh, there are important secular voices in this debate. I'm not diminishing that. But in most of these contexts, if your argument is not seen as religiously rooted, uh, it's just not going to catch on. Uh, that's not a, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's not a good thing or a bad thing necessarily. It's just a thing, right? Like that's just how people are. Like in the United States, if you, we have to frame things by reference to our constitution. That's how we function. That's like our normative grounding. Uh, and in many of the societies, religion does do that thing. Uh, so you know, sometimes this results in sort of perverse conclusions. But nevertheless, that's the language, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. We can go back to Joshua, but I'd actually like to stick to more recent times. If we look at uh, recent history, we had a brief period when it appeared that religious, religiously motivated conflict was fading a bit. You go to the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, there were reasons for optimism with people transcending difficulties and problems that seemed to go on for a very long time. And yet in recent years, as you've noted, we've had an uptick in religious nationalism in the sense that conflicts where religion and nationality and ethnicity come together, and are used as a justification for doing horrible things. And it appears that it's on the rise. You look to Myanmar and Weratu and Buddhists killing Muslims. You look at Sri Lanka, and until the recent elections, there was an increase on Buddhist and Muslim violence there. You look at India, and again, Hindu nationalism has taken on greater intensity. So the question is why is religious, is this a real phenomena, or is it just that the violence is rebadged? We've had a bit of attention among the panelists on this issue. So are these fundamentally religious conflicts with religion playing a significant role and a resurrection of an old horrible phenomena, or is it rebadging of conflicts that have been there all along? What does that imply for what you do about it? I guess I would begin this way. I, uh, I've you know, read about, heard about, watched uh, conflicts described as religious conflicts for years. I don't think I've ever found one to my satisfaction that religion was either unicausal or in isolation from other causes. So to some degree, the potential for religion, nationalism, political differences within countries or across lines is always there. And it, it is a matter of degree, I think, about how one contains it, if you will. I think in some circumstances, it can be the principal driving force, but it's never the sole driving force. Now, second question is, it, it seems to me that, uh, that, that the 
if as I look at the Balkans, for example, uh, it was it was a secular reality for all of the Cold War, uh, where you had uh, an authoritarian regime tied to the Cold War, and everything was suppressed. To some degree, the end of the Cold War opened spaces for memories to come back or or, or, or grievances unfulfilled uh, to be uh, opened up again. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I think the stability at the moment, which is partly due to NATO, partly due to the United Nations, and partly due to religious collaboration across lines, I think that kind of mix illustrated both the way in which religion was given space to be married to politics, and then other forces reached on religion and politics were able to set a framework over the conflict and limit it. It's probably a good example of why you need the use of force or the threat of it. If you didn't have NATO, I don't think you'd necessarily have peace. If, if you do have NATO, you still need uh, a religious cooperation across lines. So my sense is those factors were always there. They surfaced with different degrees of intensity it's never unicausal, it seems to me. We're accumulating more questions. Why don't we take several and then respond, and then maybe take more several and then respond? How about, how about uh, Ali Banwazizi and you two folks? Let's have three questions. I'll try. presentation, I very much, thank you so much, uh, appreciate it. Um, and praise. Um, you gave uh, somewhat a short shift to the idea of um, reformation um, within Islam. Um, in your most recent comment, in, in response to one of the questions, um, you pointed out that um, our reasonings would be much more compelling to the, to the degree that we could locate them within the tradition. So why give the short shift to uh, the, the various attempts at reformation within Islam. Um, I agree with you that uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Ali is not the most authentic voice um, in that regard. Uh, but as you well know, there are many, many others um, who are attempting to do that. And I didn't quite understand your very brief reference to, well, we had reformation, uh, and that was Wahhabism. Uh, as, again, I'm sure you know very well, um, the language of the current attempts at reformation are quite different uh, from the Wahhabi um, reformation. Sure. Uh, let's get oh, a sorry. couple more questions. Let's, did you have Answer a question yes. up there? <laughs> <laughs> He's been all right. I am alive. <laughs> Um, uh, Haroon, uh, big fan. Um, been reading the, uh, the Observer for a while now, back from my AUC days. Um, lots of parallels. Um, New Bedfordian, Browner, uh, New Bedfordian, I might add, I win. But um, the question I wanted to ask is, can any one person be held responsible for, for the basic, the incubation of ISIS, if you will. I mean, three days ago, um, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn went on record with Der Spiegel, uh, saying he is the former head of the US Special Forces, and he said that Bush's invasion of Iraq is ultimately what created ISIS. And is this statement insidiously simple, or is it admirably frank? Trying to get me deported? Thank you. Um, <laughs> We're both so, on the list, though. But. You know, you know, you know how it works, right? Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. We'll we'll see each other in Cuba, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, my name is Muhammad. So, um, okay. or as my eleventh grade uh, gym teacher would insist, Mohammed. But yeah. Fair enough. Um, so I guess two questions quickly. Uh, when I say reformation and I disparage it, I disparage reformation as a discourse produced by people who have declared on record that we, we need to go to war with Islam, and then several years later reinvent themselves as the authorities on reforming Islam. No, thank you. Um, to them. 
Uh, Reformation itself, you know, if it's organic from within the community, then it's going to work, and it's necessary, clearly. Um, but I think it's happening all the time. The problem is not the intellectual process, I think. It's the absence of institutional resources behind it to translate it from something from just an intellectual exercise to actual meaningful on-the-ground change, right? So, yes, I want to see a better conversation about religion, but I also would like to see mechanisms to leverage these interests in a, in a meaningful way. So there's a great piece uh, by Bobby Ghosh a few weeks ago about a Muslim Peace Corps. Uh, we need something like that, right? So take these young people who were dying to do something, sometimes literally, um, you know, bad joke, um, and, and uh, it's okay, we can make fun of ourselves, um, Cuba. So, you know, uh, what, what I mean is, you know, give them something, do you see what I'm saying? So translate the ideas into action. That's where I'm concerned. I have no issue with, I, I'm sick of these sort of static interpretations of Islam. I find Islamism to be a dangerous perversion of Islam. Uh, by Islamism, I mean political Islam, not jihadism. Even that I find to be you know, just kind of way off field. And we need a lot of new ideas and new institutions. Even the idea of thinking of a caliphate as a post-political entity is, to me, a new idea. Um, and that's what we need, and I'd like to see more of that. But what I, I, I'm cautioning us against is sort of buying into these sort of voices of people who have no traction within the Muslim community, who embed themselves, carefully chosen, uh, you know, with forces that are hostile to the Muslim community, who all they actually end up doing is uh, uh, discrediting the very idea of reform. You know, because if the person speaking it loudest is the person who hates you, then you're going to assume that, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I would like to see more Muslim communities invest in rethinking a lot of these ideas and concepts for our current circumstances. Um, with respect to your question, uh, look, you know, can we hold people responsible for ISIS? Uh, of course we can. We can hold Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi responsible for ISIS. Um, that said, you know, that's a good conversation. What are, what, are the, what are the consequences for people who make decisions based on bad evidence? Is there going to be any kind of commissioner investigation? No, probably not. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, Ted Cruz after the Planned Parenthood shooting, you know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, Ted Cruz after yesterday's attack, we are at war. Um, that's interesting. Right? Uh, you know, it seems to be amazing to me. I'm like, even, you know, the Second Amendment, that interpretation of the Second Amendment is held so dearly that even the idea of Muslims buying weapons isn't enough to shake people from, you know, their sort of, I was like, I would have thought, you know, like, you do realize, like, I can buy weapons too, right? That should alarm you. Um, it alarms me, right? Like, let's be honest here, right? Um, but, you know, these are, these to me are like obvious answers. Like, you know, yeah, Muslim community has a responsibility to fight extremism, but it, it certainly stands to reason that, you know, some pe you're not going to stop everyone, obviously. So shouldn't you make it harder for people to, you know, accumulate like arsenals of weaponry? Um, these seem to me to be basic or obvious conclusions. Uh, sort of an interesting point. We talk about Reformation, talk about texts that we interpret literally, and what happens when you interpret texts, you know, in certain ways. Um, but you know, I, I would like to see us have a conversation about, you know, but but a lot of these questions ultimately come down to how we use fear. If someone is scared. Um, then we will justify things we will not other justify. And that's missing in the Syrian refugee conversation. And I get that. I mean, if you say that 99.9% .9 of Syrian refugees are not terrorists, it's not very reassuring, right? Like, I'm sorry, right? But like, if one guy's a terrorist, then what do you do? Um, so those sorts of conversations need to happen, you know, from a security perspective, a policy perspective, so on and so forth. Um, I would hope we have more of an interrogation of foreign policy choices, which tend to cause us harm. Um, and a more robust debate around them um, going forward. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like that, that doesn't happen nearly often enough. Sorry, I've been talking way too much. So uh, We are running out of time, so why don't we take the remaining questions. You two folks have a question, and you have a question or a comment? Go ahead. Um, I figured out my question. Um, Professor Ever, I think at the beginning, when you started your question, you said uh, you asked about um, Vatican II uh, and then your second question was also about, you know, formation of potentially global, you know, Muslim NGO-like things uh, that would engage the population. And I think the question that's been stewing in my head is one about central authority. I think um, the conversation about a Christian doctrine of war uh, can proceed differently because there is a central authority that can define a doctrinal response. And I think that when you ask Muslims globally, if you took a survey, you would find every single person giving a different answer that can be couched in a, in a religious uh, formula, right? There, there can be doctrinal, uh, very legitimate doctrinal differences that will give very legitimate interpretations and therefore very legitimate outcomes, um, you know, under those interpretations. So part of what has been fascinating me about this question is the, the the kind of you have these 
you know, you have a Christian history of, of war. Um, you have a Muslim history of war that have proceeded very differently because of very different um, institutional bases. You have, you have a doctrinal authority, you know, under one model that you don't in another. And I don't know that there's a question at the end of this, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts on, on where you can come up with some sort of doctrinal responsibility. Is actually, sorry. My question is uh, related to Hyder. Is do I need the mic or should I just? I do. Okay. Um, so it, it's about like whether as Muslims we should try and identify as a monolith. Uh, one one of the things I think came out of Wahhabism was this idea that Saudi Arabia would say like we have a sort of ownership over like that Islamic values and ideals. And I know like my family's from Sri Lanka and pre Wahhabism, pre like globalization, their values and what they thought was Islam was very different from what it is now and off like some of their beliefs I think Wahhabis would say are are not part of Islam at all um, so there I felt like in previous to Wahhabism there was a more of like a disparate beliefs do you think as American Muslims should we try and like emphasize that part of our religion like Haider said that there's no like central authority or should we try and like create some sort of like counter central authority you know should we say like like right, like a post-political caliphate or like some sort of authority, some sort of like give power to some people to speak for us, or should we emphasize that Islam is like really not a centralized religion? Comment? Um, well, some some of that I'm not terribly sure I'm capable of answering. Uh, let me address it from a Christian side or from the Catholic side. Uh, Pluralism is endemic to Protestantism. It is based on the principle of that, so there's no single authority there, although there are clearly distinct traditions and structures. In Catholicism, you don't want to overestimate what I might call vertical integration. I mean, it's there, and it makes a difference, but there are limits to it. And on this question it itself, uh, I would have to say from 40 to 50 years working on this question, that there's a shift in Catholicism. There are fewer people uh, in Catholicism, not, not, uh, not uh, this is not uh, absolute, but there are fewer people endorsing just war criteria. There are more Catholics that I run into, into conferences and responding, who uh, it, take the idea that if you can legitimate and limit war, that's a service. They think you end up not ever limiting it. The Pope himself, if you just use that for an example, the Pope himself has said ISIS needs to be stopped. The persecution of people need to be stopped. He has said the use of force with basically UN Security Council approval is legitimate. He has said also one nation shouldn't take it upon itself to solve it. So what he's doing is carving out a framework within which there's room for lots of debate within the Catholic community about what you think of it. He himself is, as I indicated, uh, his, has adopted a ministry that I call crossing lines. In other words, he's trying to cross as many lines as he can that people regard as uncrossable. That was essentially what happened in the Central African Republic. That, and, but it also happened, you know, when he was on the way to kiss the wall, the Wailing Wall, in Jerusalem. That was the plan for the visit. Halfway through the wall, ride to the wall, he stopped and kissed the wall that surrounded the Palestinians, separated, separated the Palestinians. So he tries to cross lines. I don't think he thinks that's the solution to world politics. I think he wants to make that his contribution. I think the use of the just war doctrine will continue in Catholicism, but it is shifting even in an authoritative tradition by both word and deed. I'll just respond to your point about the caliphate and so forth. Uh, and you know, is there, if you will, an absence of central authority? Would more central authority make a difference? Uh, number one, empirically, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, it's commonly argued that uh, uh, the disappearance of the, of the caliphate has allowed, if you will, 
uh, self-appointed bad guys to sprout in the Muslim world, whereas back in the old days, there was more central control, central authority, and so self-appointed um, demagogues uh, would face more challenge and couldn't legitimate themselves. Um, but if you look at the uh, history of the Reformation, and Brian knows much more than I do, but my rough um, um, reading of that history is that, uh, as Brian says, the Protestant uh, community is very decentralized, has no central authority. And I would say, if, if you want to have sort of a bad behavior index uh, for the Catholics on the one hand and Protestants on the other for the last 500 years, I think it's about equal. Uh, okay, <laughs> roughly equal. Uh, Bryant talks about the wars of religion, and both sides, both communities, covered themselves with uh, with with shame uh, thoroughly and adequately. I think. I'm not sure that um, the uh, central uh, recentralizing. The problem is. Who decides who the central authority will be? And what if the central authority winds up being in the hands of um, folks who want to use religious authority for hate? Uh, so it's, an interesting, it's a commonly made argument. I, I'm, I, I would like to study it more before I did it. When I think about other institutions, how do we institutionalize something better? I think about um, customs that uh, maybe, again, we could import from uh, secular uh, areas uh, that have proved useful there. Uh, another institution that I think we ought to think about is the custom of, if you will, uh, truth commissions. Uh, uh, the one institution in the world we don't ask to, if you will, acknowledge when it's done wrong and teach its young that it did wrong and apologize and show contrition for wrongdoing is religious institutions. And we, well, I learned a lot from my student, Michal Ben Yosef Hirsch, who has written about the rise of a norm of truth telling in world politics and how she argues that it's become kind of a normal thing. When you're done wrong, you're supposed to, you know, fess up, say you did it. South Africa is the best example, but we've really seen it elsewhere. Germany in general has done it, and most people would say it was a good thing. Um, maybe we should apply that idea to religious communities too. We, we never do. Um, I think it would be a healthy thing for a culture to develop in every religious community that uh, there should be some examination of the way you have behaved toward others in the past, whether your actions have been consistent with your values, and willingness to accept that maybe you've fallen short and should show contrition for it. Because I think in general this is a, uh, a, a, a peace a measure for peace. Why, you know, what about you know applying that to religion? So that's the kind of institutional change that I tend to gravitate to thinking about. I think we're over time, though. Do I, uh, Michelle? Do we have to quit? Can we keep going? Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. Well, thank you guys. This has been great.